Jake, so the question about loss and mourning. Uh, you know, generally, I think all of us here are uh, in favor of experimenting with language of grief so that it never becomes trite and pat and expected. And I think everyone here has been through funeral services and memorializings of various kinds and felt the uh, shallowness and emptiness of language because it's inadequate. This poetry seems to respond to that, and in fact, all of Mod Poe does. Do you have something in favor of experimental language in response to grief and loss? Yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, we've seen this with Tristan Stara and Dada movement in general, that this was their response to World War One, And you've seen it, uh, you've seen that same impulse in a lot of European post, World War Two poets as well, uh, Paul Salon, obviously, um, and um, um, Pe Perez, is that how you pronounce his last name? Olipo? Uh, poet, Uli Olipo. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the guy who invented oh. N plus seven. Is that Perez? Well, Olipo is, of course, the group, the French group that yeah. organized around these procedures. Yeah. Right. So so those, the, those folks clearly dealt with profound grief by a uh, completely disorienting uh, method of assembling assembling mm -hmm. meaning. Emily, you've written on this topic. I have. Do you want to say something about this? Um, well, yeah, I'm kind of struggling for words, but uh, I guess thinking about loss on a personal scale and on a national scale, the, the question that it always kind of asks if you care about art is if you should care about art, if art has any positive... Um, meaning to suffering and if it can intervene in it or articulate it properly and um, I don't really know but I do know what type of language um, unequivocally fails and it's the language of platitudes, it's triteness, it's language which doesn't even try to be commensurate with the experience and this poetry this week isn't my favorite but in this moment and in you know moments before in my life I, uh, I value and take heart um, in a project which sees language as having something like moral seriousness as something that um, needs to be experimented with because it still needs to be held to a certain type of standard. So yeah, I, the question of grief and this art um, is one I think about a lot. We have among our poets this week, uh, John Cage, Jackson McClough, and a Cagean, a student of Cageanism and a student of Cage is, uh, Joan Retallick, who's a colleague of Erica's up there at Bard, and so there's a lot of influence. And these, those three people, uh, Joan is, and the other two were, alas, they're both deceased, very serious, not like you wouldn't sit around with Jackson and slap your knees and laugh. Cage, I think, took a certain amount of pleasure from certain things in life. Chess, uh, mushroom gathering, some other stuff that he liked to do. He's a fun-loving guy, but they're, they're very, very serious. Very serious. So I'm going to read, and Jenna Osman is also influenced by that side, the non, I would say the non-antic side. The antic side of Cajunism it, we're going to see next week with Kenneth Goldsmith, who's a neo-Dadaist clown um, performer of the high hilarity of early Dada. But this week, there's no such clowning on the part of most of these people. So when Jenna responded to 9-11, Jenna Osman, by um, sensing the presence of bullshit in public language, she decided to do something that a lot of people take as a non-serious strategy, an aleatory response, a chance response. Most people would say, what the fuck is that going to do? What kind of political efficacy can you get out of that? No one's going to understand you. You're just being random. Why don't you participate in the conversation so that there can at least be a yes, no, right, left, white, black, uh, as it were, conversation. And Jenna is among those who wants to absent herself from it. So I'll, I'll read what she says, and then I'll ask Gabe if he wants to stand by this strategy as at least potentially eff efficacious if he wants to. And then we'll turn to Mac, Max, Mac, we'll turn to Max to see if he has a response to Jenna's response to the white noise, the political white noise. She wrote, 
The title of this program is Finding the Words. This was after 9-11. Every day I look in the newspapers. I keep sensing the presence of what's not being told. Help me come up with a strategy to get through this white noise. She's quoting actually a congresswoman at the time. I don't have that strategy, says Jenna, except to call attention to components of that white noise so we can hear it for what it is. I'm going to read a piece made of words I found when reading transcripts of press conferences given by President Bush, Ridge, Rumsfeld, and Cheney in the last few days, she said in November, uh, late October 2001. I read the transcripts, printed them out, I tore them up, and then I stood on a chair, and then I bombed my office floor with them as if they were leaflets, and the leaflets told me what, they, what to do. This piece is called Dropping Leaflets. Gabe, how do you respond to Jenna's response to say, I have to, I have to do something else with this language because I don't have a strategy otherwise to deal with the white noise? Um, hmm. I am in support of individuals' uh, strategies to understand their political situations and what they can do as um, political actors, as writers, um, and as citizens or not as citizens in the climate that they find themselves in. And is that my response to it? No. Is that my writing practices response to it? No. But I do think that something can be said for um, a sincere vision of a writing practice's ability to create change for one's own vision of the world or perhaps the vision of the world of another person. And so um, I, I would like to not gauge the success of these writings in their missions, um, but instead see them as uh, establishing their own set of rules um, both procedurally and uh, morally or philosophically, and seeing what those can do from there. Um, I take one of the things that you've just said, and we're going to turn to Max then briefly and then go to the phone. I take it that one of the things that you've said is, I start is merely having the right or independence or freedom to choose a procedure that will work for you, as opposed to what might have been the case for most 19th century poets and earlier, in most cases, which is to say, I have given a set of tools in the toolbox. I didn't make the toolbox, and I didn't put any tools in it. But I have these, and I've got to work with them. Uh, what Jenna Osmond, following Cage and McClough and others, is saying is, I need to come up with a strategy, forgetting poetic content for a minute, I need to come up with a strategy that will make me, real, make me think make me more rather than less conscious of the way language is being used to oppress me or limit my options. I, I will say that I do agree with that summation of what I was saying, but I, I think also I would say, I, one thing I'm saying is that I have a, a, a deep respect for a gesture away from despair. And that's to me, the gesture being made by Jenna and the statement there and also from Cage's writing about his own work and even McGlow's. And mm -hmm. um, though I think a lot of us, and especially today, will feel that like those gestures are incommensurate, um, a gesture away from despair is a thing that I have respect for and, and I think can be worked with in a lot of ways. That's yes. So incommensurate is the key word today because what, what any individual can do is going to by, be by definition incommensurate with the gap, loss, absence uh, that is pervasive. So uh, it, we're going to go to Max, and it's, I'm sorry, Max, it's going to have to be brief because I want to get to the phone caller, but Max, what are your thoughts on any of this? <clears throat> Gabe, I like a gesture away from despair that's mm -hmm. actually kind of um, reassuring. <laughs> um, I uh, I have nothing to say. I I don't know. It feels absurd to to talk about randomness in the light of a terrifyingly organized hatred. Um, I hope that the left uh, can come up with something better. 
to combat this. Uh, I love some of these poems. I love some of this poetry, but um, didn't stop the rise of American fascism. Okay, Max, thank you. Um, this organized hatefulness and also a lot of disorganized hatefulness, both, I guess, conspiring to, or conspiring to organize, but still. <laughs>